right. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining. Welcome. We are at nine o'clock, so we'll get started in about 30 seconds to a minute or so. There's a few more people that are joining, so I thought I'd wait. Let as many people uh, join as, I as we can, and then we'll go ahead and get started with our presentation today. We'll be talking about how to raise seed funding, specifically talking about uh, convertible notes and safes, what you should know, what you need to know to help get some initial seed funding for your startup. So we'll start in about uh, 15, 20 seconds or so. We did send out a quick chat message saying that the the link will be available afterwards with the recording as well as the slides. So if for some reason you aren't able to watch the whole presentation or join late, don't worry, you will certainly get a link and we'll be able to uh, watch it at a later date and see the slides as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. We've got a lot of coverage, uh, a lot of materials to cover today. So I'll try to go through it as quickly as I can, leave enough room for Q&A towards the end. On occasion, I'll, I'll try to take some questions that come in as I'm talking. If it, it's on topic with what I'm discussing at the moment, I'll try to, for the most part, take questions towards the end and, and leave enough time so we can make sure we go through questions as they come up. So uh, feel free to put your questions in the chat or the, the Q&A, and I'll try to get to them as I can or, or at the very end. So today we're talking about, as I mentioned, how to raise seed funding for your startup. We'll talk about convertible notes and safes. Oftentimes, some of the early stage financing that will come in for a startup will use one or two of those uh, methods. And I'll provide some information and background on why they're, they're useful, why they're oftentimes a very good way to approach getting seed funding for your startup as well as a number of other issues that come up along the way. Uh, next slide, please. Can we go to the next? There we go. So quick disclosure, what I'm talking about today is really more for educational purposes. I don't want anyone listening today to take anything that I'm saying as legal advice for their particular circumstance or situation. It's, it's meant to provide you with a general overview and general ideas and concepts. If you need legal representation, I mean, certainly feel free to reach out to me. My contact information will be available at the end. And if we if we want to have a separate one-on-one um, -on -one discussion, happy to do that. But I uh, just want to make sure that you don't rely on anything I say today from this presentation for your specific legal needs. Next slide, please. So a quick agenda overview. I'll give you a quick overview of my background as well as the firm's background. We'll talk about some structural considerations, how to set yourself up so you can be in the best position for getting some seed funding. Documentation for founders and early personnel. We'll talk about what's important. Then we'll jump into financing options. So what are the different ways you can get funding? What are the options you have available as a startup? And then we'll talk a little bit uh, more in detail about convertible securities, which is really your convertible notes and your safes. And, and there's some other um, investment uh, tools as well. Some foundational basics to get a better sense of how those convertible notes and safes work and some of the features. Overview of seed financing, how to prepare and best approach closing your seed financing, and then some common pitfalls that I've seen over the years. I'll touch on those quickly, but it's intended to kind of give you a sense of where the mines and pitfalls are so that hopefully you can navigate around them and not uh, have to suffer some of those um, mistakes that oftentimes are made if, if you don't know what you're doing, you're not getting good advice uh, from the get go. And then we'll have, as I mentioned, some time for Q&A towards the end. Next slide, please. So a little bit about my background. Uh, I'm Ali Dabakili. I'm an attorney with Foley and Lardner. I'm in the corporate uh, group and my practice has been pretty much exclusively corporate uh, work over the last 20 years, focusing a lot on um, emerging growth and venture capital uh, clients, both on the company side as well as on the investor side. So I've, I've worked on, on both sides of that equation and understand what the startups are looking for and how to, how to represent them as they're sort of starting to get going from very early stage of a couple people in a garage with an idea, not knowing what to do, and then forming the corporation and going all the way through exit, some sort of uh, sale, acquisition, merger, et cetera. So it's kind of the whole life cycle. 
really enjoy working with startups, entrepreneurs, founders, and investors. Um, I work out of our San Francisco office um, in our Silicon Valley office, but primarily in San Francisco. Worked with startups around the world, a lot coming in from outside the U.S. to set up a, a presence here in the U.S., as well as a, a whole bunch of startups that are in the United States and growing and scaling um, California and other states as well. I love working with startups. It's really great to be a, a small part of the startup adventure that the founders go through, see what they're innovating, what they're creating. Really fascinating to be able to play a small part in that. So it's it's really rewarding work, and, and I enjoy uh, working with uh, not only the startups, founders, entrepreneurs, but also with the investors. Next slide, please. Okay, so just I always say preparation is probably one of the most important keys to success, and if you're a founder or an entrepreneur, if you've been through this before, you, you understand that because it takes a ton of work, a ton of preparation to get to the point where you've got a viable product and you, you can commercialize it, you know, get your funding in place, grow and scale and have a successful exit. So preparation is really one of the biggest keys to success. And I oftentimes try to pull an interesting quote that sort of summarizes or captures that concept. And this one from Colin Powell seems to be a good one. No secrets to success, it's all about preparation. You learn, I think you learn the most from your failures than you do from your successes. You just got to keep getting up and, and continuing the, the adventure. Okay, next slide, please. So one quick question or a couple as we get into this. Uh, how do you identify potential investors, angel investors, VCs? Also, how do you approach them? And let me address that a little bit later. Um, there are different organizations that you can go to and talk to that'll give you access to some of that information, but I'll try to touch on that in, in a little bit. Um, and I'll save the next questions for, for a little bit later. So let's let's start off with sort of structural considerations. You know, when you're when you have a startup, if you've been around and you've done this before, then you understand setting up your entity the right way is going to be really important, especially when you go out to look for uh, financing. Investors typically want to see that you've set up your entity in Delaware and then you've set up a C corporation. Now, this is really important for venture capitalists because that's typically what they like. They're, they're very familiar with the Delaware code. They're very familiar with Delaware organizations and they typically want to invest in C corporations, not in some other type of entity. The other more other type of entity that's very common that you'll see are LLCs, limited liability companies. But by far and large, most sophisticated investors, especially VCs, will only want to invest in a C corporation. So if you're thinking that you're going to need outside financing from VCs or, or other sophisticated investors, institutional investors, then you definitely want to set it up properly. So I would set up a C corporation, set it up in Delaware, and that way you've got at least the, the best entity set up in the right jurisdiction of more investors. Next slide, please. Oh, OK, hold on one second. So it looks like I'm getting some messages saying they're not seeing the slides. So. Justin, I think we're having an issue here with people not being able to see the slides. It, can some other folks let me know if you can't see the slides? I, I got a couple of comments saying they can. Well, some people can see them. OK, it looks like a bunch of people can see them. All right. Apologies, but thank you for uh, for all your responses. OK, so moving on to documentation for founders, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But it is important, and I mention this almost in every presentation I give because I've seen so many mistakes made very early on by founders setting up their entities and not having good documentation from the get go. And what I mean by that is making sure that you've got confidentiality agreements in place, intellectual property assignments in place, that the documentation governing issuance of any securities, including, for example, shares issued to founders, early personnel, early employees or consultants, whether it's it's shares or options, that those documents are properly drafted and have the proper provisions in them that are protecting the company. And I'll give you an example in a moment, as well as having those documents include transfer restrictions so that if you give someone some shares in a the company, they can't just take it and then transfer it to somebody else that you may not want to have on your cap table as a, a shareholder in the company. For example, it could be to a competitor of yours that you definitely don't want to have on your cap table. So really important of, of these is 
initially confidentiality intellectual property assignments. So this goes for the founders as well. Equally important for early employees and personnel. If you're going to have anyone work with you in the company, you want to make sure that they sign an agreement that says essentially whatever they're doing for the company, whatever work they're providing, whatever they're developing, creating, that that is owned by the company, that they can't go and disclose it to anyone. And therefore, the company will have the rights to what they've created. If you don't have that kind of documentation in place, you run a very significant risk of having someone who creates something that's really valuable for the company, subsequently leaves, and then you don't actually own what it is you spend a ton of time, money, and effort trying to create. I've seen that happen before, and it becomes a real nightmare because the company will have to go back to that individual that created the technology and, and, and find a way to get them to assign it to the company. And since they've already left the company, they have no obligations anymore. So unless you've got an agreement in place, they can walk away with the ownership and you now have to negotiate with them to transfer it over to the company. And in some cases, they might either refuse or you just have to buy them out and that can be expensive. So avoiding that from the get go, having the right documentation in place is, is super critical. I have on, on this slide, vesting of security, stock options, restricted stock, I'll, just to take a minute on that. So for founders, as well as early employees, early consultants, really anyone in the company that's going to get equity, you should have those documents set up in a way that you've got vesting conditions on them so that if those people leave at some point in the future, you want to make sure you've got the ability, the company has the ability to buy back any of those shares or options. Shares really, options will just expire if they're not vested that have invested yet. And so essentially that gives the company the right to bring back the equity that they've given out or to have that equity disappear um, so that somebody doesn't walk away with a piece of the company that's not engaged in helping the company be successful. So I've seen scenarios where people, example of a couple founders, they are maybe three founders, they each have a third. One of the founders decides after about three, four months, they wanna walk away, they're not interested anymore, but they got their 30%. So they walk away with 30% of the company. They're no longer involved in the company. They're not going to help it grow and be successful, yet they own 30%. Not a good scenario to have. Investors don't like that. So having a mechanism to take back some of that if they haven't been at the company long enough for all of those shares to have invested is, is a good way to help protect the company and avoid problems uh, down the road. Next slide, please. Okay, financing options that a startup should be aware of. You have you, there's a bunch of them. I'm not going to go into all the different types of, of financing options, but the ones that we're going to focus on today are really uh, convertible securities, primarily convertible debt and um, convertible equity in the form of safes. I'll talk generally about what a KISS is, keep it simple security, although don't see those very often. So I'm going to really focus more on safes and convertible notes. The, the third option of the three main ones is just selling stock. So that would be priced equity. Usually you'll see that um, it could be early stage as well. You could do a series C and, and self-inferred stock, certainly series A, series B, et cetera. Um, oftentimes though, you'll see sort of that initial financing, the seed financing, if you will, being done either with a convertible note or with a safe instrument. For a number of reasons I'll explain, it's much easier, much simpler, much quicker much cheaper to do it that way than to do what we call a priced equity round where we actually go out and sell stock. There are other financing options I'm not going to be talking about. So in some cases, companies can apply for grants depending on what they're doing and what industry technology, you may be able to get grants from, from local or, or federal governments. Um, there might be loans you can possibly get, or that's unlikely for an early stage startup unless you've got revenue coming in or you've got some significant assets that lenders would be willing to take a security for a loan. So usually not, not all that common, but um, something that also is available uh, on video. Next slide, please. Okay, so a little bit about convertible securities. The name itself kind of gives you clues to what it is. So it's, it's, a, it's an equity that is convertible. It converts into securities at a later date. And so there are a number of pros and cons, I'll go through it, but usually it will convert at a later date when the company goes and does a qualified for equity financing. Essentially when it goes and sells stock, doing a priced equity round, 
at that point in time, the convertible security, the convertible note or the safe will convert into shares of that price round. So some of the pros are that it avoids valuing the company because you're not actually selling shares. When you, when you issue a grant or when you issue a convertible note, you're not actually selling shares in the company at that on that date when you issue the note or the same. That comes later, as I mentioned, when that instrument converts into shares when you're the financing down the road. So the nice thing about it is you don't have to have a valuation of the company. And that can be a good thing. For example, especially in today's market when valuations are a little bit uh, depressed, as opposed to last year or the year before, you may want to avoid having to value your company so that you can you can get some bridge financing in or get some financing using a convertible note or safe, buy some time, get a runway going until some point in time in the future when you then can go for a price equity round and value your stock. Hopefully at that point in time, valuations will come back up and you can get a better valuation when you do that uh, price equity round. So that's certainly a, a pro on, on using a convertible security like a, a note or a safe to, to give you some time before you have to do evaluation. Much easier to document, less expensive. The, the safe instrument I'll talk about in a bit is I think four pages in length as opposed to a priced equity round where you might have you know over 100 pages or so in multiple documents and agreements. It's a lot less expensive. Legal fees are, are generally a lot less. It's a lot quicker. So because there is less documentation, and it's easier to get done, it's usually a lot quicker as well. So something else to keep in mind. Some companies, some startups, if they if they just need some initial, very, very early seed stage financing, and they don't want to go out to a whole bunch of people, but they've got some sort of friends and family, if you will, they might just do one safe or one convertible note, get a few hundred thousand dollars, five hundred thousand dollars, or just enough to be able to get things going to the point where then they can go out and either do a more uh, a larger round or offering of convertible securities, or they might even then wait and go to a uh, price equity round. So if they're just doing one safe or one convertible note, that's very easy to put in place and typically a lot less, less expensive. You can also do a, a whole offering of safes or convertible notes and go out to a whole bunch of people with those instruments as well. Some of the cons, convertible notes are, it's debt, it's a loan. So it's gonna have, to, it, it may need to be repaid at some point in time, but Keep in mind the people that are investing using convertible notes, they, they don't want to get their money back. They typically are investing because they want to have it convert into equity in the future. So it's not as if they're looking for return of their principal and interest. They really aren't, but it is debt nevertheless, and there is a requirement to repay it. Typically, there'll be a maturity date. So within anywhere from a year to three years, uh, that will have to get repaid if the company hasn't otherwise done a financing. Convertible notes have what I refer to as sort of an extra liquidation preference, if you will. They get paid out before equity because it's debt, and typically creditors are going to get paid before equity holders. So that's good for the investor, um, not as good for, for the company. Conversions can be a little bit confusing. There's all sorts of conversion uh, language you'll see in a convertible note or a safe, and you just need to make sure you understand the details and how it converts and what you need to do to calculate the conversion and can result in sort of sweetheart deals for investors. If, if the early investors negotiated good terms on the safe or the convertible note, they can get a real sweetheart deal. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, but essentially it means that they can get a, a really good discount on the price of the shares when the shares are issued in this future qualified financing. And we'll explain a bit about that. Um, typically less protections for the investor. So yes, there'll be some reps and warranties. They're typically very light, but you're not going to get the full suite of reps and warranties you'll see in a price equity round. So for example, if you've done one of the price equity rounds and you've seen the stock purchase agreement, and I'm referring primarily to the, the model forms that are available at the National Venture Capital Association, they're sort of the model forms for the price equity round financings. You'll see the, the reps and warranties cover probably a good eight to 10 pages of the document. It's a lot of reps and warranties that the company gives. You won't find those in a safe or a convertible note. It doesn't mean you can't build them in, but, but the whole point of it is to make it simple and easy. So the reps and warranties are, are typically pretty light, pretty light. So good for the company, not as good for the investor, although investors are very, at least in the US, are very comfortable with the, the safe and convertible notes have been used everywhere. Safes have been used globally as well, even though they started off here in the US. 
The next slide, please. So let's talk about one of the critical terms or a couple of the critical terms when you're talking about convertible securities. This, this applies to convertible notes as well as uh, safes. So oftentimes you'll see a mandatory conversion, which is really, as I was mentioning earlier, the, the instrument converts. So whatever was invested, let's say a million dollars was invested via a safe or convertible note, that million dollars is going to be converted into shares at the next qualified financing. And you might see the term used differently. It might be called next qualified financing or equity financing or qualified financing, but they all mean essentially the same thing. That's the point in, in the future when there is a financing that the investment may be a safe or the note will convert into shares that are sold in that financing. So in some cases, there's no threshold. So it's any equity financing. So the next time the company goes to sell um, stock, it could trigger the conversion or it, there could be a threshold so that they have to actually raise a certain amount in, the, in that financing in order for the, the conversion to be triggered. So we oftentimes see, it, it varies, but oftentimes you'll see a, a typical uh, threshold being about 2 million. Uh, the YC Combinator form of SAFE doesn't have a, a particular thre uh, threshold, so it defines it a little bit differently. So anytime the company then goes to sell um, preferred stock and financing, there's no threshold that would then trigger the um, conversion. So important to just look at what those what those terms are so you know when it would convert. They oftentimes will have a discount or valuation cap. We'll talk about that. But a discount basically means that when the qualified financing takes place, whatever the purchase price is for that stock that's going to be sold without financing, if the people that invested via safe or a note have a discount, then you're basically getting a discount off of that purchase price. So if the qualified financing the purchase price per share is going to be a dollar a share and someone got a safe or convertible note that had a 20 percent discount they're going to be able to get the stock for 80 cents per share instead of a dollar a share so they get they get the benefit of that discount the conversion cap price cap also called valuation cap works very in a very similar fashion it essentially results in them getting a discount off of the purchase price of the next qualified financing because you use a cap on the valuation that you will use to determine what the actual purchase price will be. And if the valuation cap in your safe or note is lower than the valuation for that price financing, then you use the valuation cap number because it's lower and that will generate a lower purchase price per share than if you use the valuation that's in the term sheet for the financing that's, that's being done. We'll go into that and give you a couple of examples. Um, conversion upon a change of control or sale. So in some cases, you you know, a company will issue a safe in January, and then in March there's a sale of the company. So what happens if you haven't done a financing? The safe hasn't actually converted. The note hasn't actually converted. So what do you do now? You're selling a company, so you're not going to do a financing. So in some cases, you'll see a provision that says, okay, we understand that scenario might come up. If there is a change of control, then this is what happens to the investment that the people made using, using a safe or a convertible note. In some cases, you'll see a conversion at maturity. So if, for example, in a convertible note, convertible note the maturity dates three years, the company hasn't done a financing by that time, then either automatically or by decision of the company or the investor, the investment amount will convert into shares. At, at some sort of formula on how you calculate the shares. You can't use the next financing because if they haven't done a financing, you don't have those metrics to use. So there'll be another mechanism for deciding what it converts into. It could be fair market value, it could be some other number, but essentially there'll be a conversion at maturity if there hasn't been another financing. Next slide, please. So on convertible notes, and this is where some there are some of the differences you'll see, it is a note, it is a loan, so you'll see a maturity date. That's when the loan needs to get repaid. You'll see an interest rate because a loan, in order for it to be a loan, has to have an interest rate. So the interest rates are usually set pretty low because, again, the investors aren't looking to get repaid their principal and interest, and that's not what they're looking for. They're really looking for the note to be converted into shares at some point in time, and then the company to go and have a very successful exit. And at that point, they'll make a, a bigger return on their investment. 
So you'll see typically a pretty low interest rate. Um, you can have valuation cap or discount. You can have conversion terms that um, will indicate when the uh, convertible note will convert. It can be an automatic conversion, meaning going back to what we talked about earlier, if there's a qualified financing, then the convertible note will automatically convert into shares at that financing. Or there can be a conversion, as I mentioned, at maturity. So three years goes by, the company hasn't done a financing, those that investment will convert into shares. So with convertible notes, it can be secured or unsecured. Most often you'll see the convertible notes unsecured, which is better for the, the company, meaning the company doesn't have any assets that are being secured um, and would be used or, or available by the creditor if there was ever a default. Um, some investors want to have secured notes because they know now that there are going to be higher up in the priority if there ever is a default. If you have a security agreement that's securing your loan, you're typically in a much better position and a higher priority for payout. There's, it gets really complicated and, and there's even among secured creditors, there's a hierarchy of who got their lien first, first in time and perfected it, et cetera. I'm not going to go into all that, but, but just know that there are two flavors of these convertible notes, either secured or unsecured, unsecured being the more common one. Um, quick question here. What is the current interest rate on convertible notes? Um, I, I typically see the, the interest rates anywhere from well, it used to be until interest rates went up, you know, you could see them as low as about three or four percent. That's not the case anymore. Now, now typically seeing six to eight, six to ten percent. I would say say probably between six and eight percent is what I might typically see. Um, but it is important to keep your eye on on the interest rates because obviously as the interest rates go up, then there's a tendency obviously for for the um, interest rates and convertible notes to go up as well. Default provisions, understand what the default provisions are. The representation of warranties, you'll see that the reps and warranties are typically pretty light in convertible notes and safes as, it, as compared to a price equity round where you've got more full sum reps and warranties, but it's still important to go through those and make sure those are, those are accurate and that the company can give them. Um, another question here, does the interest add up to the total amount of the point of conversion? That's a great question and let me take that now. So. Yes, with convertible notes, you've got this feature of the of the, the principal that's being invested. And then over time, you will have interest that's going to be accruing whatever the interest rate is. So there's a, there's a couple of ways to do this. Um, in one scenario, the conversion will convert the principal and interest. So in your calculation and determining what exactly is going to be converted, you have to not only calculate the principal balances, but also you have to calculate the interest as of the day of conversion. So that when it converts, you're converting all of the principal and any accrued interest into shares of that financing, that uh, qualified financing. Other ways I've seen this treated is only the principal converts, the interest gets paid out in cash. So the company would pay the interest in cash, only convert the principal. I've seen it done both ways. Um, depends on what the company has as far as cash. So is it going to get enough cash from the financing to be able to pay the interest? Does it make sense to pay the interest? Uh, depending on what the terms of the, the notes say, are they getting such an incredible discount that that additional interest is going to result in more dilution and they'd rather pay the cash and avoid it. But essentially, all of that would be provided in the terms of the convertible note. Okay, the last item here is amendment terms. So not a lot of focus is, is paid on these, but it's important because if you're going to go out to multiple people and issue a bunch of convertible notes, then what happens if, let's say, you've got a maturity date of a year and you're coming up on a year, but you need more time to be able to get your qualified financing in place? Let's say you need another three, four months. Well, you're going to be out of time and now you're going to hit the maturity date, which means the company may have to repay that. What do you do? Well, you can amend the note to, to extend the maturity date. But how do you do that? If you've got 10 notes that you've issued to 10 different uh, note holders, 10 different investors, then basically you'd have to go back to each and every single one of them to get them to amend their agreement to extend the maturity date. Another way to approach it is to have in your, in your terms of your note a provision in the amendment section that says essentially if we have a majority of interest in the, in the note holders that all agree to amend the note, 
then that amendment will be good for everyone. So you basically need to get a certain percentage to agree to make an amendment, and that will apply for everyone. And so the type that oftentimes you'll see that as an effective way to be able to make some changes without having to go back to all 10 of those note holders and get them to approve the change. And the best example is the one I just gave is if you need to extend the maturity date, basically if you've got the language in there that says I need to go to a majority, you go out to the majority, maybe it's three or four or five of the 10, and as long as they consent to the amendment, then the amendment will apply for everyone. So it makes it a lot easier, less of a burden on the company to be able to do that. Next slide, please. So switching gears now and talking a little bit about SAFES. So what, what does a SAFE stand for? Simple Agreement for Future Equity, introduced by Y Combinator in 2013 as an alternative to the convertible note. So what Y Combinator had been seeing with a lot of the startups that were coming through the system is that it's taking a lot of time to do convertible notes. It, it's taking a lot of time to do the priced equity rounds. It was taking time, a lot of effort, a lot of money to do to get in some cases, what could be a relatively small amount of an investment, but having this to spend a lot of time and money and effort to document it, you know, in sort of the, the more traditional way that used to be done. So they came up with this very short form called the Safe Simple Agreement for Future Equity, and and essentially it's that it's it's a very simple agreement. It's it's four pages. It's it, it talks about effectively what will happen. They put you put in your money, which is your purchase amount, and that money will be converted into shares when the company does a, a price equity round. And there's a couple of different flavors, uh, a couple of different types. There's what was referred to as the pre-money valuation cap, which was generally more founder friendly. That's no longer available on YC Combinator's uh, website. They, they changed that and now went to what's called a post-money valuation cap, which essentially is a little bit more investor friendly, um, but that's the one you'll typically find on their website. There's one that has discount only, so it doesn't have any valuation cap, but has only a discount. And then there's one that has uh, uh, MFN, which is the most favored nations provision. I'll talk about that in a moment. But you know, you can take those and use those. Some people will tweak them and change them. Some people will add not only the valuation cap, but also a discount. So essentially, you run the calculations of both scenarios when there's a conversion, and whichever one gives the investor more shares is the one that would be applied. So if they get more shares using a discount, they would get they would use the discount. If they get more shares using the valuation cap, then they would get the additional shares from valuation cap. Um, so that's another another variation of that that you might see. And the MFN is essentially it's uh, most favored nations, which means I'm giving this to you with these terms, but understand that if company you go and give a better safe with better terms to somebody else in the future that I'm going to get the benefit of, of those same terms, the better terms you've given somebody else. So if you give someone else most favored nation status is what it's called, then you also need to give that to me. <clears throat> They're typically viewed as pretty investor friendly. They're simple, cost effective. The safes, it's not a loan. There's no maturity date. There, there can be a maturity date. I've seen where there's a maturity date by. So if you haven't, if you haven't converted by X date and you have to pay the money back, not very common, but typically it is not debt. It doesn't have an interest rate, and so it doesn't show up on the financials of the company, and otherwise not treated as debt. So those are some of the reasons why it's it can be a very effective uh, instrument for taking on early sort of seed seed financing, if you will. Next slide, please. So talking about valuation caps, um, I talked about the pre-money and the post-money, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but essentially you use the, the pre-money or, or post-money valuation to determine when there is a conversion event, when there's a qualified financing, you would use that number, whatever that valuation is, to calculate out the number of shares that would be given to that investor in that qualified financing. And if the number results in more shares, then using the valuation for that financing that's going to be taking place. If it's lower, then you'll get more shares. So you'll use that calculation. You'll use that valuation versus the, the valuation that's going to be used for the actual financing. Uh, we talked about the most favored nations uh, provision, uh, MFM provision. 
The conversion terms are, are going to be important to take a look at. We want to make sure you understand how that conversion is being calculated, how the, how the computation is made, because you're going to use the company capitalization um, as part of that. So you need to understand what that is. And, and you know, different safes can, can use different terms. The YC combinator is pretty consistent in its definitions. But what happens is sometimes people take that form or they'll create their own form and there'll be a very different way that that calculation is done. So you really need to go through and and I would suggest that you take some time to model it. I mean, as attorneys, when we're working on transactions, you know, where there's a financing coming up and there's a bunch of safes, we'll go through and run through the safe document, read it, look at how the conversion takes place, and then model it out in performance so that you can look and see using the calculation that's in the safe how it's going to be converted into shares in that qualified financing. But I would certainly encourage the founders when you're going through the process of issuing safes is to is to model it out and you're not going to know what the terms of your qualified financing are if you don't have one yet but you can make some assumptions and just assume assume you're going to be doing a, a five million dollar raise at a pre-money valuation of, of x and you know run your calculations just create a pro forma based on that and then plug in the calculation for the safe to see what they're going to get when you convert with those assumptions even though it's sort of artificial because it's not you're, you're creating all these assumptions it'll help you understand the mechanism of the safe and how it converts and, and it'll also help you understand what's better to give one with a discount or one with the valuation cap sometimes you may not have a choice because the investor is going to demand one or the other but if you do have a choice and you can pick and choose then if you've modeled it out you have a better way of figuring out okay well in this case i want to give a safe that's got a discount because that means i'm going to ultimately end up giving less shares than if I were to give a valuation cap at this amount. Understanding the reps and warranties, there'll be some relatively light reps and warranties from the company, some from the investors as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Prorata rights, that's important too. You don't see it. Um, oftentimes you won't see it in the actual safe agreement, although it could be baked into that document. In some cases, you'll see a separate side letter. So for example, the YC form <coughs> of safe doesn't have the pro rata rights built into the safe, but there is a separate pro rata rights letter that uh, is available at the YC Combinator website that um, essentially provides them with the investor with the pro rata rights. So essentially what that means is, you know, they will have the right to keep their percentage interest. They'll have the right to buy more shares in the future to be able to keep their interest um, at that, whatever that percentage is. <clears throat> and it's handled differently depending on are they getting pro rata rights you know, in their safe before there's a qualified financing or once there's a qualified financing, let's say they end up with 10%, do they have prorata rights to maintain that 10% on a going forward basis? Other rights can be spelled out in the side letter uh, or in some cases in the safe too. So for example, do they get major investor status, information rights, inspection rights? There's all sorts of other rights that you'll typically see in your priced equity round and in some cases, those can be built into the safe instrument or, or the convertible note as well. Next slide, please. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. This is another instrument for oftentimes seed funding or financing. It's called the KISS, Keep It Simple Security. It was introduced by 500 startups, and it was really introduced as an alternative to convertible notes and the Y Combinator safe. So, it's very similar to the safe. It has some different features, uh, but essentially think of it along the same lines. It's it's an instrument that is used to take an investment from an investor. It gives the investor the right to get shares at a point in time in the future when the company is a qualified financing. Very similar sort of uh, provisions about, you know, is there a valuation cap, discount rate, is, is there a most favored nation status? How does it convert into shares when there's a qualified financing, et cetera? Uh, also pretty simple and cost effective. I don't see these very often at all, so I'm not really going to spend much more time on them. You'll see more often than not convert the notes and safes. I, I've rarely seen um, just as used. But anyway, just mentioning it, so at least you can hear the term, you understand generally what it is. Next slide, please. So some foundational basics, you know, I'm going to go quickly over this. I cover this in a lot more detail in some of the other presentations I give. But, you know, as you're going through and thinking about raising financing, you also want to be thinking about 
you know, making sure the alloc allocation of equity amongst the founders is right, that you've considered allocation of equity amongst early employees, early consultants, people that are helping contribute and help grow the company, that you understand all of that before you go out to do your first raise. I oftentimes think about or talk to clients about thinking about it backwards. So planning for your ownership control dilution, but thinking forward maybe two, three, four years, what that will look like and then plan for it going backwards. So important to understand dilution and how it's going to impact founders because you will be diluted as you go through various financing rounds. And it's important to understand that because you don't want to wake up one day and realize, oh my gosh, you know, I just completed my my uh, financing and now I've got, you know, a lot less ownership in the company and how did that happen? And if you are involved in the process, which oftentimes you are, you understand it and talk to your lawyers because, you know, you can explain it and, and we're preparing a lot of the documentation so we can go through that, walk you through that process. But essentially understand it, it's going to happen. You're going to end up with a much smaller slice of larger pie eventually than having a larger piece of a much smaller pie. Important to incentivize your team as well, so so people have skin in the game that are there to, to help you grow and scale, and we'll stick around. Again, proper documentation. We talked a little bit about that. I'm not going to go into it in much more detail. There is another presentation I view where I talk more about divesting and conditions and repurchase rights, but it's important to be thinking about that. Next slide, please. So here, here are a couple of examples. I'm going to give you. Um, no, let's go back one slide. Okay, so this is sort of a very, very simple example, not considering option pools or, or other equity like saves or anything like that. But if we start off with a, a pre-money of uh, valuation of $10 million, well, let's assume that the company has 10,000 shares that have been issued to three different founders, people that so everyone has 33% 33 interest. They each have 3,333,333 shares. So if there's an invest, so the company then goes and, and gets a $3 million investment at a dollar a share. So it's $10 million, which is the pre-money valuation, divided by the 10, 000, 10 million shares that are issued outstanding, and that results in um, your dollar a share purchase price. And now your post-money, meaning your pre-money valuation is 10 million, you've taken on 3 million as an investment, so your post-money valuation is 13 million, right? 10 million plus three, 13 million post-money, post getting this investment. Um, <clears throat> so founder A, who previously had 33%, after this $3 million investment is factored in, they will have about 25% of the company. And you can see the reason why, because now their shares, the total number of shares they have, divided by the post money valuation results in them having been diluted down from 33% to 25%. Um, Next slide, please. So some other examples here where we're using convertible securities. So the first example is using a convertible um, security with just a discount. So just talking about discounts, not valuation caps. So if there had been a $450,000 investment using a convertible security with a 25% discount, then using the same numbers as we used uh, previously, the holder would receive 600,000 shares, right? So we use uh, $450,000 um, divided by the, the price per share uh, minus the discount, they're going to end up with uh, 600,000 shares. So you can see see the impact of, of a discount. So instead of buying the shares at a bucket share, they're buying in that um, the 25% discount. So they're going to get more shares in that scenario. Now, looking at another example where you have not a discount, but an actual valuation cap, same numbers, $450,000 investment via convertible security. Now we have a $5 million cap, valuation cap. No discount, just a valuation cap. So in that scenario where we had a, um, a pre-money valuation of $10 million, plus money valuation of uh, $13 million, the holder would have received 900,000 shares because the $5 million valuation cap is less than the $10 million pre-money valuation. So when you look at the valuations, you're always looking, if you have a valuation cap and you're safe or your convertible note, you're looking at 
are you going to be using the, the, the valuation cap because that's a lower number or are you using the valuation for the financing? So in this case, the 5 million is less than the 10 million. So you're going to use the 5 million to calculate out the number of shares. So when you, when you run the numbers, you basically come out with 900,000 shares by applying that 5 million uh, valuation cap. So you can see the benefit. You're essentially getting, you know, almost double or approximately double uh, on your shares. So really important to be considering, are you giving a discount? Are you giving a valuation cap? And then the third scenario is where you've got both in your agreement. So you've got a discount and a valuation cap. And in that scenario, you have to run the calculations to figure out in which scenario is the investor going to get more shares. If the language is written such that you use whichever calculation generates a large number of shares, then when you run the calculations, you'll be able to figure out, are they getting more shares by using the discount or are they getting more shares by using the valuation cap? In this same example I'm, I'm showing you, if they just use the discount, they got 600,000 shares. If they use the valuation cap, they got 900,000 shares. So in this third example, they're gonna end up with the 900,000 shares because that gives them a the larger number of shares. So that, that's where you can kind of see how the impact of the discount versus valuation cap can be uh, important. Okay, next slide, please. So we've got about uh, 14 minutes or so left. Um, let's talk a little bit about overview of seed financing. So we've talked a bit about some things to get you ready, thinking about foundational issues, proper documentation early on, setting up the entity properly in Delaware, the C-Corp, et cetera. We talked about the different convertible securities, convertible notes, safes, kisses. So let's sort of do an overview of, of the seed financing. And sort of this, this can go into a lot of detail and we could spend a ton of hours on this, but if, running through it quickly is make sure you've got a credible business plan. You should have milestones. What, what does the company need to meet in order to, to achieve X, Y, Z, et cetera? Perfect your pitch. Um, you know, even though you may be going out for the seed financing to people that are going to be investing in convertible notes or safes, you may not be talking to venture capitalists. You may not be talking to more sophisticated investors. Um, but anytime you go out to talk to anyone about raising money, it's a great opportunity to hone your skills on on pitching and, and presenting your company. And you have typically a very short period of time. People have short attention spans. So you really need to be able to nail it and get them the, the concise, detailed information they need. Explain in a way that it's easy for them to understand. And also explain it in a way so that they can understand how they're going to make money. Where, where did they get their big payday if they invest with you? I've oftentimes seen founders focus so much on the company. Like, oh, we're going to do this and we're going to accomplish this and we're going to change the world. And, and nowhere in their pitch do they ever talk about how does the investor get a return on this investment? Because ultimately that's what they're looking for. They may love you, they may love the product, the innovation, the technology, whatever it is, but at the end of the day, they are looking for a return on investment. So part of any pitch has to be communicating to them, how are they gonna get a return on their investment so that they can factor that in and say, okay, I like the product, I like the, like the team, and okay, now I get it. I understand how I'm gonna make money on it, and if the assumptions are correct, yeah, I think this is a, this is a good investment. Run a systematic process, so know how much capital you need, know who to connect with the right investors, understand your ideal term sheet, prepare for diligence, make sure all your corporate records are in really good shape. I've seen a whole bunch of scenarios where they get to the meeting, they get to the term sheet stage, they haven't bothered to get their documents in good order. And, you know, sometimes the investors will do some diligence initially before they sign a term sheet. That's very common, but they don't do the real deep dive until after the term sheet's signed. And then the sort of the process starts. So you'll have the diligence period where they're really getting in. You're opening a data room. You've got a bunch of documents up there and they're going through it with a fine tooth comb, oftentimes with their counsel. And they're going to see things where there are skeletons in the closet. You haven't done things properly. You're missing documentation. So make sure you clean all that up before you ever go out and talk to investors. And then be prepared. If you haven't done that, there's going to be some cleanup that you'll be uh, required to do. So going back for a second, there was an earlier question about how do you identify investors? How do you make sure you talk to the right ones? How do you approach them? Where do you find them? There are a lot of trade organizations. There are a lot of um, 
events, certainly in the San Francisco, the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, there's a ton of events that are going on. There's probably half a dozen or a dozen every single day, different organizations. You know, if you if you spend a little bit of time trying to understand, okay, what's my industry technology, what space am I in, what events are there that are catering to that area, and then start to see different organizations putting on events, that's one great way to go and start meeting people. And I would encourage everyone to go and meet as many people as you can, get to know people in the community, not with an eye towards going to the meetings and, and asking for money, but more just building relationships. Because going to investors is, you know, you, you want to make sure you built good relationships whether it's with the investors directly or whether it's with people that you can introduce you to the investors, focus on the relationship, not so much on asking for money. Because if you've got a good, a good relationship established, that'll go a long way towards getting you in front of the right person that has the check that they may be going to write. Make sure that you're doing some diligence on the investors. Oftentimes I've seen founders think of it, they were like, oh, okay, I've got to be ready to explain my company and I've got to be ready to, to make sure that they understand everything about my company. It's it's really like dating. You need to understand them as much as they need to understand you. There, there are some investors that are not going to be the right fit because they're either investing in early stage versus later stage or only in later stage or only in certain types of technology or certain industries. You need to know that. Don't waste your time going and trying to develop a relationship or even to, to meet someone at a particular investment firm or investment group if, if that's not what they're into because chances are if that they're not into it they're not going to want to invest in understand and spend some time on on the term sheet so there is a, a model form of a series a term sheet which could be used for a series seed investment as well that's available at the national venture capital association's website that's sort of the preeminent site that has uh catered to investors venture capitalists companies founders etc but they built a suite of model forms that everyone uses, probably 90 plus percent of the priced equity venture capital financing deals use those forms. And they have there a model term sheet and it's got some good annotations. So if you take some time, you can download it. It's all available free. Read it, try to understand the terms, go through it a few times so that you're familiar with it because the investors will know the term sheets inside and out. And if you don't know it equally well or have someone that can advise you, you'll be at a disadvantage in negotiating. Prepare for diligence. Make sure you spend the time to understand where your skeletons are. And if you can you know, clean all that up, do so early on. Uh, make sure you've got good corporate hygiene, as I like to say it. So your documents are in good order. You've got documents saved and, and, and a good, easy to understand and, and um, uh, set up in an organized fashion. So you've got a data room. You know, set up your data room now. Uh, there are a whole bunch of data room uh, resources available. Some of them are free, some of them are, are, are pay to play, but find one that's reputable. And when you set it up, you can set up the structure in a way that investors will want to see the data room set up. And that way is you, you keep it current so that when you get to the point in time when you've got a term sheet, you're ready to go. It, it's already done. You've already done all the prep work. So you can quickly give them access to the data room and it's already organized, it's current, and maybe there'll be a little bit of updating to do, but very minimal. I've seen a ton of time wasted because companies weren't ready. They signed a term sheet and then it took them a week, two weeks to get their data room ready. Meanwhile, the investors sitting around saying, okay, what well, guys, what's taking so long? I'm, I'm ready to go, I wanna do my diligence. And now I've gotta wait a couple of weeks. Not a good way to start off the relationship with, with an investor. Next slide, please. OK, so with regard to seed financings, if we're talking about doing a convertible note or a safe or even a kiss, although probably not going to be seeing a kiss, make sure you understand these terms. We went through some of these, you know, download the forms from the Y Combinator website. The Y Combinator website, is, they've got a really good set of forms. Obviously, most of the safes that I see are typically started from their base form or, or is just exactly their form without any changes. But they've got a lot of good articles. They've got a lot of good information there on how to use it. What do the terms mean? So make, that would be a really good starting point. And then make sure you've got a good attorney that understands and does a lot of work with startups and, and financing so they can help guide you through the process. But understanding the terms, the purchase amount, the valuation cap, discounts, MFN status, what does all that mean? How does it play in with each other? What should I be thinking about to negotiate a better term for the company? And what are investors typically 
typically going to be looking for. With safes and convertible notes, I, I've seen it done both ways where the investor has their own form that they like to use and, and they may not veer from that or may not entertain a lot of negotiation. But often, often than not, I also see the company being in a position to say, hey, we'd love to do uh, safe financing. Here's our form of safe. So it does give you a little bit of a better chance to have your form all ready to go, maybe with some tweaks or some changes that are a little bit more beneficial or protective for the company that you can then send out. When you talk about a price equity round, totally different story. If you've got a VC coming in, um, in some cases, they'll want to drive, the, drive it and, and prepare the documentations, or they may want the company to prepare the documentation. But then oftentimes, most often, you're using the NVCA form. So you've already got a form to start with. And then it's, it's about negotiating tweaks and changes here and there to, to the form. So a little bit different um, with regard to safes and convertible notes. There is no sort of standard form of convertible note. So everyone has their own. A lot of times the lawyers that you work with will have their own form of note. Um, there may be some um, legal service companies like Clerky that have some sort of basic forms of convertible notes. My only caution there would be it, it's not like forming a company. It, you know, even though Clerky and some of the other companies do a really good job of the formation documents, you know, when you go out to actually raise money, there's a lot of things that go into place and you've got securities issues you need to be complying with. But you also need to be able to understand where you can negotiate some of those terms. And having a form is good, but what you really need is you need a lawyer who's negotiated a whole bunch of those over the years who understands what's market, what's market in your area, for your industry, for your type of company. Um, it, and it changes, believe me. There, there are, are changes regionally. So for example, what you might negotiate here in Silicon Valley or San Francisco may be very different than what might typically be negotiated on the East Coast with a safe or, or a convertible note. So those sorts of things you're typically not going to get from an online service provider like a, a legal Zoom or, or one of the other number of companies. That's where a good lawyer can really um, provide you with some good, good solid advice and steer you in the right direction. Okay, next slide, please. We're almost at the hour, so um, a couple other points, then we'll jump to some common pitfalls. So very, very high level overview. The term sheet is sort of the, the initial starting point. Once the term sheet's signed, that's when everything really starts. The diligence will start. The investor will be asking for documents. They'll probably send you a, a diligence request list. Now, having said that, the, the process is a little bit um, more manageable, a little bit quicker, maybe not as involved with a safe financing or a convertible note financing as it will be when you do your first qualified financing. That's when you get, you know, typically a lot more in-depth diligence because you've got a more sophisticated investor, a VC that's coming in. Sometimes it gets done on these safes and convertible uh, notes. Sometimes it doesn't. It depends on who the investors are. So I'm going through what is probably a more formal process, but at least be aware of it. If you have a less formal process, that's fine, but just be ready for a more formal process. So you sign a term sheet, there'll be a diligence process, You'll have a, you'll want to have a data room set up, documents uploaded. They'll go through. You work through the diligence issues. The documentation process is pretty simple. If it's a safe or convertible note, there'll be some other ancillary documents that will be needed for the company to approve the financing. Um, since you're not selling stock, you oftentimes don't need to do anything with regard to amending your charter or certificate of incorporation because nothing's going to happen until your next financing when it will be amended anyway. Um, so usually it's a lot simpler and a lot less documentation. Plan for sort of pre-closing, make sure you need to you have what you need to be able to provide the investor or investors. And then the closing process, again, relatively simple. Once you've got all the documentations, signatures are exchanged, then they'll go ahead and wire the funds. And then any post-closing items if there are any. So once, once you close, you want to make sure you now go on your cap table and you, and you build out you can create a separate worksheet, if you will. But now you want to make sure you're you're capturing every single note or every single safe that's been issued and, and that you've built out your calculations to understand, okay, what is it? Are they getting a discount? Are they getting a valuation cap? What is it that's there so that then when you do your qualified financing, you've already kind of built your model out. So you just need to plug in the numbers and then it'll generate what 
the shares will be that they'll get when it converts. So you can start the process and build the skeleton. So again, saving time on the back end when you get to your qualified financing because you've already done the, the diligence and, and the, the work now to sort of build it, create it. Next slide, please. So closing receipt financing, everyone kind of refers to sort of the ABC, always be closing, always be thinking about closing. So from day one, when you've signed your term sheet, if you have a term sheet, then that's when you should be thinking about what am I doing today to be closing this transaction? Always be closing. Do your homework. Make sure your documents are good. We've talked about all this. Um, do your own diligence so you identify issues before they do, before the investors do, because the earlier you can identify them, the sooner you can take care of them. So then they're not a problem, not going to be a diligence issue for the investor because you've already taken care of it. Prepare for your closing from day one. We talked about that. Make sure you've got your team. I mean, if you're a really small company and it's just you or you and a co-founder, then that's all you have. But make sure you've got an external team to work with you. Um, I think a lot of times founders say, yeah, I, don't need, I don't need to work with lawyers. I'm just doing a safe. It's super simple. I'm doing a convertible note. Um, you can, but again, if you don't know where the, the traps are, the pitfalls, you may accidentally um, sabotage yourself and not get the best deal because you didn't understand something the way the lawyers that work on these on a daily basis do and can guide you. Set reasonable timelines, organize, divide, divide tasks so that it's a lot less of a burden um, process for you. Again, this is going to be relatively simple compared to your qualified financing. So I'm going through a more formalized um, process, but if it's just one or two safes or one or two notes here and there, you won't need to go through as much of this of a formal process, but it's still good to know what that process is if you need to. Um, next slide, please. Okay, I think there's one slide before that. There should be one called um, on the pitfalls. There we go. So here I, do, I put down, there's a lot more than this, but here are some of the more common mistakes I've seen where people didn't do things properly and, and it resulted in problems for them. So not structuring the entity properly, setting up a California LLC when they know they're going to go out to investors and get third party financing, not having the proper documentation. So they had a founder who left after three months and, you know, is holding 20% of, of the company and they have no way to get that back. Not having the proper technology IP documentation. So the person that's actually doing the coding for your software that's going to be the main driver of the value of your business doesn't have an agreement that says, hey, whatever they're developing for the company, the code that they're, they're building is owned by the company. Not having proper vesting for equity grants. Um, the, the thing about vesting is, and you see this oftentimes, the, the standard vesting is four years with a one year cliff. And what does that mean? It means essentially that you want to make sure that the people are going to be with you for at least four years and that they don't invest in anything after they've completed an entire year's worth of work. Because that's really the test, right? You want to make sure that if you bring someone in the company, including founders, that they're going to be there for at least four years. Because that's a long enough period to say, okay, I'm there, I'm, I'm participating, I'm engaged, I'm, I'm really incentivized to make the company grow. Because if I leave before that period, I'm going to walk away with less than what I otherwise would. Undocumented stakes in the company, someone had a discussion some point in time, and there was something said about them getting a percentage of the company and then nothing ever happened. You go to do a raise, they come out of the woodwork saying, wait a minute, you promised me 5% of the company and you've got nothing to re uh, refute that, it can create problems. Not complying with securities laws, uh, not managing cap table. There's a whole bunch of other things there too. Understanding the employment law risks when you're a startup, they're there, understand them, get good, good legal advice, and then understanding tax issues that may come up as well. There's a whole bunch more, I, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but there's enough there. And the, and the real message is, is get some good legal advice as you're going through the process. I know sometimes budgets are not there to work with your attorneys. Uh, oftentimes attorneys will work with you and are amenable to some sort of alternative financing arrangement. And that way you get the benefit of, of getting someone there to help guide you and working within, within the constraints of your budget. Next slide, please. Yeah, this goes without saying, do your homework, prepare in advance, agreeing backwards, um, you know, visualize what you want and then work backwards to make sure you can attain it. Next slide. 
So I'll leave my name and my email. Feel free to reach out to me. Let's do some Q&A. Um, we're a little bit over 10 o'clock, but we've got some time left. So let me run through some questions. If I miss any, just put them back in the chat so they'll pop up. Um, I'm just running back through here to catch. Okay. Okay. Sorry, a lot of people asking for slides and the link. Definitely, we'll get the slides and the link to the recording. So, in terms of maturity date, what happens if the company doesn't have the money to pay the investor back by that date? How do you get your money back? Is it just a risk of making the investment? Great question. And it, so, if you're talking about a convertible note, remember that has a maturity date. It's a loan, so it is owed. And and if the investor wanted to, they could enforce that and go after the company and sue the company to get their money back. It rarely happens because most investors that are investing in a convertible note understand that it's risky, that there's a chance the company might not go anywhere, it might not make money, it might not be successful. So they're really risking that, knowing that the chance of, it, of them getting it back is, is probably some to none, especially with a startup, because as soon as those, money, those monies come in, they're gonna be spent to help grow the company. So it's not as if startups are sitting around with a lot of cash in the bank, they typically aren't. So if the maturity date comes, comes and goes, and they haven't done a financing, they haven't gotten anywhere, the chance of them having any money to be able to satisfy a judgment, even if the investor sues, is, is probably spent to none. So they're typically just going to take that as a loss. Same thing with the safes. The safes don't have that. They're not a creditor if you're a safe holder, so you don't have that as a loan. You can still go after the company, but it's not as if there was a maturity date saying you're going to get paid back by X date if they don't do a qualified financing. I have seen, however, some safes that include that language where there is a maturity date. And what I've seen there is if the maturity date comes and, and they haven't done a qualified financing, then the, the holder of the safe can have the option to convert their purchase amount, the investment amount, into shares using some conversion metric that doesn't rely on a, on a financing. Because if they haven't done a financing, they won't be able to use that as a metric. But for example, it converts at the fair market value at the time, and then the company can go out and get a accounting firm or valuation firm to come up with a fair market value, and then it just converts based upon that fair market value. So I've seen that as a way, but uh, it's typically it's the risk that the investors take and they understand that, or at least they should understand that. Okay. Um, can we return to different discount valuation cap and discount slides? Um, yeah, you know, um, yeah, feel free to reach out to me separately. I mean, essentially, conceptually, how they work is you're using numbers to calculate out the price per share. You're, you're, and you're, you're, you're going to use that number depending on what safe you have or convertible note. If the safe has a discount feature, then when you calculate out what the purchase price per share is for that qualified financing. So, as an example, if you're going to be selling stock at a dollar a share and a qualified financing, if you have a discount of 20%, then you'll be able to get that share at 80 cents a share. If you've got a valuation cap, and just using sort of general concepts here, if you're, the valuation of the company is 10 million, that's, going to, that's the 10 million is going to be used for the financing, the qualified financing, and that's going to generate, let's say, a dollar a share purchase price. And you have a safe that says you're going to use, you have a valuation cap of five million. So that's half of what the valuation is that's being used for the qualified financing. So when you do the math, you should come out with basically half price on the stock. So you should be able to get that stock for a, a significant discount, i.e. 50% of what they, the investors that are going to be buying it at the bucket share are going to be buying it for. Um, so the, the importance of understanding the valuation gap and the discount is, I mean, you got to do the, do the math, and I'm happy to, to talk with you offline, but basically, once you do the math, you figure out discount will give me a, a, a discount off the purchase price at this rate. Valuation cap, if it's lower than the valuation used for the financing, it'll give me a price per share of, of this amount, and whichever one is the better one is typically what the investors are looking for. From the company standpoint, when you model that out, you know, usually you're better off giving a discount. But when you model it out and figure out which one's better for the company, then you can offer that to an investor. And if they otherwise don't have a preference, if you give them one that's more favorable for the company, you, you basically 
done right by the company because there'll be less dilution on the founders because the, ultimately the investor will be getting less shares than if they had chosen maybe another method. Okay, let me look at some other. So, um, can you please send a link for the standard template for term sheet safe and other? Yeah. Um, can we go back a couple of slides? Go back. Let's see, there's keep going, keep going. One more. There we go. Oh, actually, that's the Y Combinator website. Um, I don't have the one for the NBCA, but it's basically www.nbca.org. That's the website for the National Venture Capital Association's website. That's where they have all the model forms, the term sheet. They also have all the forms for a priced equity round, a venture capital financing style set of documents. Um, let's skip back to the last slide. Um, <clears throat> okay, are safe notes with a discount common in the UK for a UK registered business? Yes, I have seen a number of safes for UK uh, businesses and um, again, it depends on on what form of safe they're using. I have certainly seen a lot of safes that were used um, for companies outside the US. And in some cases, they follow the YC form. In some cases, they follow a totally different form. The YC form has gained a lot of popularity. I mean, it's very popular in the US and it's gained a lot of popular popularity outside the US too. So you could certainly use the, the form of YC safe even if it's a UK company or a company in other jurisdiction. So you may have to change some of the terminology. If you go to the YC Combinator website, they actually do have some form of safes for some other jurisdictions. And I'm forgetting offhand which ones. I think they have one for a Cayman entity, a Cayman Islands uh, style entity, as well as maybe one for another non-US entity. But um, you can look at those as well to get a sense of what may be different. Some of the terminology will be different than you'll see in the, uh, the YC or the US safe. How does personal credit debt work into all this? How do I move from personal credit debt to convertible notes or whatever type of notes may be available at the time? Um, not quite sure I understand the question. Um, personal credit debt. Yeah, it, so this the, the convertible notes are all based on the company going out and issuing the note. So it's not. It doesn't have to do with the individual founder's personal credit. Um, it's really, and it's really not, the investors in convertible notes aren't approaching it like a bank would. So they're not gonna be doing a, a credit check. They're not gonna be asking for your you know, information to run a, run a, a check on your credit score. Um, I, I, I don't see that happening it, because they understand it, it's not, it's not a, a type of risk they're willing to take as a, as a lender would. They understand they're really investing to get shares in the company. They're not interested in getting paid back their loan. So they're usually not looking at it from the same lens that a, a typical bank would look at it. So the, the credit piece is, is not, I don't see that being a factor. At what point do you believe a micro company should consider seeking funding to scale? What indications or indicators should we be aware of? Um, well, it all depends. So, you know, even very, very small companies, if you have the type of solution or technology that can be commercialized on scale, then, you know, why wouldn't you? Um, because as you scale and grow, you get the opportunity to become more of an, an attractive target for an exit. So a buyer that would be interested in buying your company. Uh, the more you scale and the more you grow, the more you drive revenue, the more you can show market acceptance, the more you can show you know, that, that your solution is better than the other competitors, that your profit margins are higher. You know, all of those factors being considered would be what would make you an attractive target for an acquirer. So if you do have a company that could scale, I think it's more about timing, right? So make sure your ducks are in, in order that you've got everything necessary to be able to scale and grow. And a lot of times that's the funding, right? So you need to have your milestone set out so you can get to, you know, um, MVP, you can get your prototype going, you, you know, you, you understand the market well enough, that you've got maybe pilot projects going to prove that this works and that you can generate revenue, that you've got some early adopters that are significant players in the marketplace. And there's all of those factors that come into place and that can help you work a timetable out as far as how how fast, when and how fast to scale. 
the only thing I'll say from from experience is, you know, companies that scale too quickly, if you're not prepared for that accelerated growth rate, sometimes that can create challenges. And if you don't have the the, the personnel and and the ability to to scale effectively and efficiently, you can run into all sorts of problems. So it's something that if you are looking to scale, maybe having someone come in as an advisor or someone that joins your team that's done that before that understands some of the the challenges and the tension points uh, that can explain that and help guide you through that might be might be helpful. Hopefully that answers your question. If not, feel free to reach out to me separately. Um, okay, so let me see. I think that covered. We've got about 15 minutes to go, so let me just make sure I got all of the questions here. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, another question. So if I'm using personal credit to fund my startup right now, how will I, how will convertible notes help me pay off debt when I finally do get convertible note funding? Okay, I understood your question. Thank you for that follow-up, by the way. Yes, that is that is an all too common scenario where founders are bootstrapping and using their own funds, and in some cases, basically loaning money to the company to cover expenses that the company otherwise doesn't have the funds to pay. So what I would say is document it. Make sure you've got good documentation to show what you've put into the company. If you're treating it as a loan, then make sure you document it as a loan. And then when you get to the point in time when you can bring in some financing, make sure you're, you're transparent with your investors. You can talk to them about, hey, I, I've funded this. I put X thousands of dollars into the company. I need to be able to get some of that back. I, I, I did it as a loan, so technically the company owes me the money, and here's the documentation. That's a much better story to tell investors because you, you've documented it properly, right? Going back to basic principles, good documentation. You've got the documentation to show that you actually loan the money. And then you can go to the investors and say, hey, look, I'm, I'm doing a million dollar raise here. I'm, I'm owed $100,000. I'd like to pay all or some of that off. Now, the investors are, are going to want to know that. And they, they may have a say and they may say, look, we don't want you using any money now. We'll allow you to use some money from another finance. Or they might say, look, you owe, you're owed 100000 We're putting in a million. We don't want you to take 10% of that to pay you back. Why don't you take half of that? or some other portion of that. So negotiate, make sure you have the communication so they know what it is you're planning on doing with the money. The last thing you want to do is take the money in from the financing, pay yourself back, not tell the investors. When the investors do find out, that can really ruffle some feathers and, and say, well, wait a minute, you never told me you're going to basically take the money that we thought was going to be used to build the business, and instead you're just repaying yourself. But I've certainly seen a lot of scenarios where investors are okay with some of that money being used to pay off debt that the founders incurred, as long as there's good communication and transparency and, and proper documentation. Given the fact that most startups never ever see the light of day, is there such a thing as premature incorporation? Um, that's a good question. And I get that, I do get that question a lot. So what I always say is <clears throat> there are some thresholds where when you get to them, that's definitely a sign to incorporate incorporate. So examples being if you're going to hire anyone, consultant, employee, you definitely should form a corporation. If you are going to if you have any customers, if you actually have a product or a service and you're starting to get to the point where you can commercialize it, that's a good point in time to incorporate. Obviously, if you're going to go out and want to get funding, you definitely have to incorporate because nobody's going to invest in you personally. They want to invest in an entity. So a couple of things to keep in mind. On the investor side, they will only invest in an entity, obviously. So you have to have a corporation when you're getting close in time to be able to go out and ask for financing. And what I'll say about that is you don't want to show up at a meeting with an investor not ready to go. So sometimes they get the question, well, you know, why don't I just wait, save the money? Let me just go meet with the investors. And if they're interested, then I'll incorporate. I think that's the wrong way of approaching it. Because when you show up at the investor's table or a meeting, you want to be ready. You want to show them that you are diligent, you've done your homework, and that you're prepared. The last thing you want to do is show up and the investors say, okay, great. Yeah, this is really interesting. Um, tell me about your company. Oh, well, I haven't formed it yet. So what you've signaled to the investor is that you're really not committed because you haven't formed your company yet, and you're waiting to kind of see what the investors want to do. I, in my view, experience, that's not, the, that, not the right approach. Form the company, have it ready to go, and then go meet with your investor. On the other side, 
employee in hiring people, having customers, signing contracts, any of those sorts of things. If you have more than one founder, you should definitely have the corporation set up because that's more focusing on how to protect the company, how to mitigate liability. If you have an employee and you don't have a form of corporation and then there's an issue, guess what happens? The employee's gonna sue you individually. So that means your individual assets, your home, your car, your money in your bank account, all of that's gonna be open to um, potential um, you know, assets that that employee can use to satisfy the judgment if they're, if they're successful. So you wanna shield yourself as a founder from your personal liability to being at stake. And the way to do that is to create an entity that gives you that protection, that liability protection. So that would be another reason and another point in time when you would be ready to set up a corporation. Um, okay, pros and cons for registering your company in the UK. Um, well, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. If you're in the UK or in the EU, obviously if, in, if you're in the EU, but you're based in UK or you've got some connection point in the UK, it's probably gonna be easier, better to set up over there. You can always come to the US later, but if that's where everything is that's going on, there's there's nothing wrong with setting up your company in the UK. Um, it's it's fairly easy to go from the UK to the US. It's fairly easy to go from from anywhere, you know, the EU, the US, the UK, the US. The UK, especially since since our laws in the US are largely modeled off of the UK laws, um, there's a lot of similarities. And, and there's a lot of cross-border work that gets done from UK, but also from the EU to the US. So I wouldn't think, I think the bigger deciding point there is what activities, what's going on in Europe or in the UK that might be better for you to set up there initially. And then once you've got enough traction, maybe once you've built, you've got a product or you're ready to commercialize or you've commercialized it and you wanna now enter into the US market, that's a better story to be able to tell because when you get to the US to go talk to investors, you can say, oh yeah, we already set up in the UK three years ago. We've got a product there, our sales are this, our revenues this, we've been doing really well. That's a really good story to be able to tell investors in the US because you've already proven it. You've already proven that you can do it. You've already proven you're in the market, you're selling, you've got revenue. That's a much easier sell than if you haven't done any of that and you're going to invest in and, and telling them that, well, you're, you're going to do this, you're, you will do this, but you haven't actually done it yet. Hopefully that answer um, answered your question there. Um, I think those are all, let me see if you have any other questions. Yeah. I think, no, uh, you know what, let me... Here's the, the website for the National Venture Capital Association. So you can click on that for the, for the person who asked about the link. That's the link for the NBCA, where you'll get really good information and forms. That's for a price equity round, but it's a really good, uh, a good site to go to with some really good information. They do have a really good term sheet there. Again, the term sheet is for a price equity round. So, and sorry, I didn't clarify that earlier. So with, Convertible notes and safes, you can do what's called an offering of them, of those. And that's where you go out to multiple people. So you may not just want to do one safe, you may want to go out and raise $2 million using safes or $3 million, whatever the amount is. And you may want to go out and talk to 10 or 15 or 20 investors. So if you're going to do that, then then what you should do is you should, you know, hopefully we'll be able to choose a, a lead investor. Maybe one of the investors you plan to talk to is going to write the biggest check. They would be your lead investor. You go talk to them, you negotiate a term sheet with them for the safe financing, and then use that term sheet as, as your roadmap for what you're going to be generating and sending out to all the other investors. So again, that's the more formalized process, and you don't have to do the term sheet, but it, it's helpful because it gets you orientated to all the terms you're going to be putting into the safe. And that's when you have that negotiated, then you can go out to the other, uh, other investors with that form of safety created that can be part of the offering, if you will. So just to clarify, the, the term sheet that's available on the NBCA uh, website is a term sheet for a price equity round where you're actually selling preferred stock. So it, it can be helpful to read through and understand it, but it's not gonna be an appropriate term sheet to use for a safe financing or a convertible note financing. So just, just keep that in mind. <clears throat> 
Do you have recommendations for potential accelerators, um, accelerated VCs who favor pre-seed or similar financing rounds? Um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of accelerators and a lot of incubators. Um, certainly in the Bay Area, you'll see a ton. Some of them are attached to universities. So a while back, I used to be involved with uh, UC Berkeley's uh, one of UC Berkeley's um, program that was Skydeck, and they have a really good system uh, where you can apply. And if you get approved to be a part of the program, then you basically come to the university. They've got a, a whole penthouse up on, on the building, one of the buildings on the campus there, close to campus that you work out of. They make introductions and, and help provide you with all the resources you'll need to sort of get to the point where you can get investments and start growing your company. So I would certainly look at some of the universities that have accelerator programs, um, Stanford, Berkeley, and the Bay Area. There's a whole bunch of others all throughout the United States as well as in other parts of the world too. Um, and then there's some some well-known ones like Y Combinator, there's 500 startups, there's there's a whole bunch of them. So if you do some Googling and spend some time researching, you, you can come up with a, a list pretty quickly, and that'll be a good indication of some that you may want to talk to. Um, to answer your question though, there are some accelerators, incubators that are looking for companies that are in a particular um, industry or sector, or focus on a particular type of business. There are also what's become very popular is impact funds, uh, where you'll see either accelerators or incubators that are set up to help companies that are doing something that's going to be impactful for um, the community. So it could be something in renewable energy or sustainable energy, or it could be something else, infrastructure projects, something where the company is developing a, a device, innovation, technology that's going to be helpful to the community in some form or fashion. And you'll see some of those that are dedicated to that. So it really depends. If you spend some time researching, I think you can come up with a good list. Um, which website or template do you recommend for data runs? Um, that's a really good question. I, I'm not in a position to really recommend one over the other. Um, there are some, some very popular ones. What I would do, though, is I would certainly encourage you to you know, look at different data rooms, look at the different companies that, are, that have used them, what you really want to make sure is that it's easy to use, but also that they do a really good job and really focus on data privacy and security. Because the last thing you want to happen is to use a data room that maybe not as well is not very well known, and they don't do a really good job, and then there's some sort of a leak or a hack, and and we just don't want that to happen. So I would probably go with with one of the more trusted names, and if you do a Google search, ask around. Um, there's a whole bunch of them that will come up on a, on a pretty quick list, and some of them are free, and some of them pay for for their use. The more sophisticated ones, um, they can be pretty pricey, so I would, I would probably not go for that as a startup. Um, that may be later on down the road, but um, there are some really good uh, resources out there. Okay, so we're almost at the 10:30 uh, marker, so I'll I'll hang on for a couple more minutes if there's a few final questions. But did want to thank everyone for participating. I know it's a long block of time in your day, so it's an hour and a half. I definitely appreciate everyone taking the time to attend. I am available if you have questions or want to connect with me. Feel free to reach out. My email is on the on the screen. The link for the video and the slides will be made available. We'll send a, an email out. Probably give us a couple of days. We have to download the recording and and check it and get it in a, in a format that we can send it out as a link, but we will do that and then make sure that uh, everyone has access to uh, to view that. So thank you again. I do I have some other programs I've done too. So you should be able to access that on the idea to IPO website as well as the Foley Ignite website. Um, and otherwise, uh, if you need a link to some of the other ones, uh, feel free to reach out to me as well. But thank you all. Good luck with everyone. Have a great day.